so hey everyone, I'm Pat Cooper, uh, president of AMA Boston. Thank you all for being here at tonight's AMA Power Hour with special guest Ramley John, Managing Director at Product Lead. Everybody. So just some agenda and uh, guidelines to follow tonight. Uh, from now till 620, we'll be doing a Q&A session with Ramley from 620 to 630. We'll open up the floor to some audience questions. And for the final half hour of tonight's event, we'll be doing breakout rooms and networking sessions. So just some guidelines to follow generally. Please keep your mic muted unless you're given the opportunity to speak. If you have any questions you'd like Ramley to address, please feel free to add them in the chat. Please keep your cameras off until the networking portion of the event. This event is being recorded, so you'll be uh, able to watch this on our YouTube channel shortly. And finally, feel free to take photos and share the event on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram using hashtag AMA Boston or at AMA Boston. So just a little bit of background of AMA Boston. We are the uh, networking and educational uh, marketing hub of Massachusetts. Um, you'll be able to accelerate uh, your career, learn new skills, stay on top of trends, and make your next career moves much quicker with our monthly seminars, weekly podcasts, monthly newsletter events, and much more. Get recognition for uh, your career as a member. You will have access to our exclusive programs and have credibility in understanding how to make an impact through marketing and take advantage of our monthly programs and become partners as well. And finally, connect and discover. Join our exclusive Boston Zone uh, panel discussions marketing mingle network events, workshops, and fireside chats in person as well as virtual, uh, although it has been more virtual these days, and discover a sense of belonging and purpose, get firsthand experience in all things marketing, lifelong learning, and personal growth. So you can visit us today at amaboston.org if you're interested in becoming a member. Um, just add on that hashtag, or sorry, that slash, become a member to join today. And finally, a little bit of background into our different uh, membership options for professional or academic membership that is less than $13 a month, for undergrad student membership that is less than $3 a month, and for a group membership, it's less than $10 a month per person. So now I would like to formally recognize uh, Ramley John. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Ramley John is a product growth marketer with over 13 years of experience, starting his career as a full stack developer and data analyst. He now helps product led companies convert more users into lifetime, lifelong customers. Ramley is the author of the best selling book, Product Led Onboarding. An educator at heart, he has helped train hundreds of the world's fastest growing product led companies to level up their user onboarding experience to turn more users into lifelong customers. So Ramley, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great that we can get you at one of our AMA Boston events. Um, so I'd like to start with a, a few questions uh, tonight before we jump into uh, questions from the audience. Um, so Ramley, as the managing director of product led, uh, how would you define product-led growth, and what is its importance in an ever-growing digital marketplace that we see ourselves in today? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for the invite, by the way, um, to Pat and everybody else in the AMA. Um, I mean, in terms of product-led growth, I, it's just this transition. Uh, it, you know, we've seen it for a while now in the, consumers, the consumer side where think about how you buy shoes or how you buy cars or how you buy perfume. You, you want to try it you want to try out the shoe first you go to the shoe store you try it out um and if you, even if you order from zappos they make it easy for you to return it because the whole risk in terms of buying something is will you actually like that thing and that that trend in the consumer space is now moving over to how we buy software traditionally if you look at um, the history of how people buy software you, traditionally you, you have to talk to somebody in sales to even try it out and there's this whole move now in how do we de-risk and make it easy for consumers to purchase software and, and even not just software, but potentially hardware where they can try it out before they buy it. 
And that's where really product like growth has really picked up in the last five, five to 10 years, where now they're, the power is shifting from uh, the, the, the businesses who, who are holding information and now moving towards uh, making it easy for people to, to sign up for something and to try it out uh, and really to experience the value of the product even before they make the purchase. So it, if I had to sum it up into a definition, it's a go-to-market approach where you're front-loading value for, for people so that they can experience the value of the product even before they make the purchase. Perfect. Thank you, Ramla. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, especially uh, digital product-led growth is becoming increasingly popular today. Um, so one of the most effective ways for a brand to grow is to build community. How does an organization create a product-led community with their product-led growth? And what are a few first steps to take towards building one today? Yeah, I mean, that's, if people have heard there's uh, the last two years, a year and a half, we, we've been stuck in, in our homes due to pandemic. And really that's risen the rise of like online communities. And really that's where uh, companies can take charge of that. And, and to put it in the context, we, we actually started product like we're an education slash consulting company helping sales side companies turn uh, apply product like growth. And we built this Slack community for product people and product growth people and anybody who's inter interested in product like growth. And really like that's been our main acquisition channel. I think that's one power of building a community. It's not, not only is it a great channel to, to for people to plug into your product even before they, they purchase your product, but as well, uh, second benefit to that is you, you get feedback. You get feedback from, from people. You have insiders within the product for, uh, within the community that can really tell you uh, what features are working, what's not. Uh, and the third thing that communities can really help out with is referrals. I think it's easier for somebody to refer another product growth or somebody within that space to join a community rather than if you're not really fully in love with a product. It really that you're putting your neck out there to to build that um, to refer a product to somebody else, which is you know eventually what you want to do is refer refer the product, but referring to the community is important. But starting out with it's like really getting to know like who I think who who you're serving and and like plugging into um, exactly what kind of problems they're facing. Um, and you know if you look at AMA, like this kind of events are perfect place to start building a community around a specific problem whether that's, you, you said it earlier, Pat, like upskilling marketers. Uh, once you, you plug them into like some kind of events, uh, then you, you want to find them like a, a space online for them to connect. Um, if, if, if you, you know, right now with this event, there's me and you talking, but eventually what you want to do is get the community members answering other community members' uh, uh, questions. So you, you, become, you become like a facilitator and less so uh, as a uh, you know, teacher at the front, the teacher at the front of the stage, like telling people, here's the answer. Uh, really like the transition from now is like, how do we create a space where people are introducing themselves to each other and really caring about each other and helping each other out. And it really, I think that's, that's you being involved in that space, whether that's on Slack, Facebook Messenger, uh, Facebook groups, or, or there's other apps right now like Circle, where you're 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 really showing and modeling what does what does it mean to help somebody out in that community? Whether that's answering questions, uh, making connections, and things like that, and people will see what is good behavior within that community, and people will start modeling you after that. So that's that's the context, and really that's what uh, how community has helped out product led and how we started that from scratch. Thanks, Rama. Yeah, it's so true to helping each other out in the community is how you, you know, you grow your brand. It's how you grow your product. When I think of product-led communities, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm thinking uh, Strava, Nike, HubSpot, Salesforce. Salesforce has a digital community where users help each other out on the platform. And it's such an effective way to uh, you know, maintain the growth of that company's having and help refer new users who maybe having issues with the platform or with the product. So yeah, such a good, uh, you know, example there with uh, users helping out users. Speaking of building a community, you run a weekly podcast, Growth Marketing Today, that uncovers the proven step-by-step -step marketing strategies from experts such as Rand Fishkin, 
April Dunford, uh, and others. So what led you to build an audio-centric community around growth marketing? And what makes your show stand out against other marketing podcasts and experts? For sure. I, I, what I really love about um, start, pod, like, pod, starting a podcast, uh, I started that actually four years ago to this month. And one of the best place, one, one of the best unexpected benefits of starting a podcast uh, is really finding, uh, meeting new people and, and becoming friends. And it, and not just friends <laughs> when I say, okay, well, how is that going to help my business? How is that marketing? At the end of the day, like when you make friends with people, they refer you to somebody else. And a story that I had, I have is like after 10, 15 episodes of Growth Marketing Today, uh, somebody, one of my guests referred me to somebody else who was looking for somebody with growth skills. And that turned into a $15,000 contract just based on that introduction. And I didn't have to um, hard sell because that, that was a warm introduction and that you know, that really is like an example of uh, when people think about monetizing a, a podcast and thinking of it as marketing, they think I need to grow my number of listens. I need to grow the number of people who are subscribing to my podcast. And that's how I'm going to get the most benefit from that podcast. But people miss out that the guest experience that, you know, when you have a guest on the, the show uh, could also be another method of getting referrals and getting just introductions and meeting people who are uh, potentially mentors as well. Like I, like I said, like you mentioned, I, I got a chance to chat with Rand Fishkin for like one-on-one -on -one for an hour. If people are not familiar, he started Moss.com and he's doing SparkToro right now. And it was just an honor. Like imagine somebody just randomly messaging like Rand Fishkin or Hidden Shaw. It's like, hey, can I pick your brain for an hour? The chances they're going to say yes. It's very slim. But if you have a podcast show, they're more likely to jump on and just chat with you. And what it turned out to be is I'm asking questions that I directly apply to my business, to, to, my, to my work. Uh, and so I essentially got an hour, quote unquote, free mentorship with that session. So, I mean, I highly encourage people, whether you have a business, whether you're new in marketing, just starting a podcast is such a great way to network with, with other people because people are more willing to say yes to you. And yes, to, to jumping on an, uh, a podcast show rather than a sales call or a picking a brain call. In terms of building a community, I, 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 could, have, I could do more. It does grow market today. It's really product-led podcasts. The other podcasts that I hosted started about two years ago where really we tapped into that community space. And one of the things we do with product-led podcasts is highlight like community members who are very active on Slack and just asking them, hey, you, you seem like you're responding to a lot of questions. We want to feature, feature you on the product-led podcast. So now the community becomes a source of guests, uh, a source of place. And, you know, it, it, it's just a great way to kind of the podcast audio experience kind of match and marries with the whole uh, community experience as well. Like now you're plugging people in, in who are tuning in to, to, uh, to the podcast. And you're, if you have any other questions, uh, join our Slack community and we'll, you know, I'm, I'm there and a bunch of other product-led leaders are there. So I think that's the next step of not just an audio where like it's me telling you and broadcasting my, my thoughts. It's now you're going back to that idea where community members are helping other community members and you're kind of uh, just facilitating those conversations. Great points there. Yeah, Rama, I got to uh, admit, um, you were definitely one of my first marketing podcasts I subscribed to up to 40 today, but you were number two uh, right up there with those weekly episodes. It was great getting insights into a bunch of expert speakers, a lot of, you know, diverse trends across the marketing and, and business development landscape. And there is so much you can do with a podcast. I mean, you can break down the audio clips into YouTube, TikToks, uh, Instagram reels. You can turn to a blog. You can bring it into the Slack space where your company uh, currently builds a lot of community. There's just so much, you know, untapped potential with just the podcast itself. 100%. Um, yeah. You've also published a book, Product-Led Onboarding, that I wanted to talk about tonight. Can you briefly sum up what the book is about, uh, where people can find it, and, and why people should start reading it today? Yeah, I, the uh, Product-Led Onboarding is really focused on helping people uh, improve their onboarding experience. It's specifically more for product-led companies where, you know, when people sign up for a product, especially when it's 
free to sign up or easy a free trial, you really want to make sure that that first experience is super, super uh, valuable and great and seamless. So we just, I put together like a six step framework that, that we've been applying and helping different companies out to improve their onboarding companies like Mixpanel, uh, like uh, OutSystems, uh, SnapOn and, and more around this. Like we've helped out hundreds of people improve their onboarding experience. And really that's, that's what the gist is and, and why people should read it, especially marketers. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like marketing can bring people at, at, at the door and help them get there. But really, especially for recurring products, where the money is at is trying to retain and getting getting them to come back over and over again to the product. And I have data from ProfitWell, uh, which is this other company. They, they, they surveyed over 500 different types of companies, B2B and B2C, software, hardware, physical products. What they found is when people have a great first impression of a product, whether that's, once again, software or physical, they're two to three times higher to come back over and over again in after 10 weeks. So really like that first impression with a product is sets people up for success within your product. And if people miss out on that and people ignore it, that, that onboarding experience, then you're, you're setting your, 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 your users and customers up for either success or failure. So I think that's why it's super important, especially with marketing, you're trying to get people out the front of the door. It, it's like, a, it's like throwing a party, you know, like marketing is like, sending out flyers to everybody and asking them, hey, come to my party. And then they come to the party. You want to make sure that the party is great, that the music is amazing, the food is great, that there's a pool ready for people to jump in. And that whole experience from the in invitation all the way to the front of the door, welcoming the guests, to getting them connected to the food, to, to, the, to ha having fun, is really what the whole onboarding experience is about. Because if you don't, you're just... You spend a lot of money on the flyers. You spend a lot of money getting people out the front of the door, and they they look at it and the party's dead. <laughs> like you just wasted all that resources to throw this party, and nobody actually stuck around. So I think that's the reason why it's super important to get that. Thanks, Rambo. Yeah, I think I saw a Twitter poll probably half a year ago uh, where it was, "Would you rather spend a lot of money invested in good marketing?" Uh, with a bad product or a good product with, you know, not so great marketing. But, you know, if you put all your time, resources and energy into good marketing with a bad product, you're going to have no retention. Sure, if you have a lower budget, you have a really great product, it may take more time to spread the word, but you have a lot more retention, you're going to build up community and marketing can always build up over time. Um, and where can people uh, find that book, Romley? Sure. I mean, they, if people want to check out the, the first chapter of the book for free, they can go to onboardingbook.com uh, or it, it's also available on any Amazon store. So just type product-led onboarding and it should be the first one that pops up. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We'll make sure to share that in our upcoming newsletter and our follow-up event emails in case you want to snag a copy. Uh, so I will go ahead and open up the floor to uh, any of our audience that has a question. Chris, um, you might have a few that you collected from the chat or DMs. Everyone's being a little quiet in the chat tonight, so we can open it up and see if somebody wants to come off mute, if they had anything they wanted to ask Romley or um, thoughts on the conversation, things they want to chat about. Feel free to take yourself off mute if you'd like and just chime in. Oh, Sunny, go ahead. I'll be brave. Hi. Um, so Ramley, uh, your book is number two in my stack because <laughs> we all have a stack of books that we have to read and yours is next. Uh, so forgive me if you address this in your book or not, but can you talk to us a little bit about customer onboarding and how you can use that as a filter to filter out good fit customers right. versus getting rid of some of the crappy fil uh, customers that you just don't want hassling your customer service teams? Great question. Yeah, I mean, I, I would look at it in two ways. I think the first way is just segmenting them right from the get-go as they're signing up uh, would be like trying to figure out, um, you know, what an example I can think of that, that does this really well is Wave. Wave accounting, if you go to waveapps.com, as you're signing up, they ask you, hey, what are you trying to do? What is your goal with Wave today? Wave is a financial tool for entrepreneurs and they have three main products, right? They have the uh, sending physical invoices is one of the goals, one of the goals that they solve 
another is doing payroll and third is around um, sending payroll and getting paid. So they have some kind of payment structure. And the last one is not sure. So I think one of the clear, one of the ways is you're, you're getting people who are signing up, customers who are signing up from the get-go to really uh, segment themselves, self-segment themselves as to what they're trying to achieve. For people who said not sure, so you're probably not going to spend as much time uh, really like devoting resources in them because they, they're still kind of not entirely sure what they're trying to achieve with the product. I think that's a great way is to a front, front segmenting from the get-go where what they're trying to achieve with your product could be a great way. And, and it, it could even be like you find out that there's one main use case that your best customers use it for. Uh, and in this case, maybe it's sending that invoice. So you're, if I was Wave and I knew that people who select number one are two to three times higher to convert. I'm going to devote more resources in that specific use case than the other two options. So I think that's one way. The second way is 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 through through uh, product engagement uh, data. So like seeing as people are signing up, seeing what they're doing inside. So somebody who, um, for example, with Zoom, uh, if somebody signs up for Zoom, they've done nothing else. Uh, sure, that that you might not spend any resources in that, but Somebody who signs up, connects their Google Calendar, sets up their first meeting, and they've already done their first call. For me, that person is high, higher value because they've already started using the product. They've sh they're started sh showing a lot more intent in, in within the product itself rather than somebody who, who just signed up and did nothing. So I think any kind of product engagement data and try to identify which, which engagement within the product signifies that somebody is really interested and uh those ones now i can probably devote more resources and and i if if you if you ideally know more a little bit about their company size and, and other things like that awesome um anybody else if you have any questions feel free to take yourself off mute chime in don't be shy <laughs> Nope, oh, Sunny, another one? <laughs> I can ask questions all day long. Um, so you have obviously done a ton of research on customer onboarding, and you've seen really good examples and really poor examples. Can you give us an example of some of, your, some of the more clever ways that companies have, especially at a very early stage, have engaged um, prospects and encouraged trial to conversion? Like what are some of your favorite examples or some of the more clever ways that you've seen companies actually take this task on? Yeah, so like trying to engage them human to human, is that, is that it or just like with it or yeah. I, it goes back, it go, once again, it goes back to that, like one of the best times to do a, a human outreach. <laughs> that sounds so weird. Like we're in the AI world where Term Terminator is, go is going to come. It, it, one of the best times to reach out uh, via email as a one-on-one -on -one would be when, whenever they achieve something as a win, a quick win within the product. I've seen, so I've seen higher response rate, like 40 to 50 or even 60% response rate when you when the re outreach is more more so phrased as congrats ramley if for example zoom congrats for ho hey i just want to uh sunny i just want to congratulate you for hosting your first zoom call i wanted to know if you have any questions and we can help you out with anything else i think th those response uh, is a lot higher i think just identifying the right moment to to reach out to um the other moment that and i've done this with AppQs, another tool well where i was trying to set up something and I kept getting an error. I think that's another perfect uh, proactive outreach where somebody reached out to me and said, hey, Rami, we noticed you, you're you stuck here. Do you, do you need help? And I was like, yes, let me jump on a 30 minute call right now. <laughs> and I jumped right onto a call with that account, uh, account executive, uh, account manager who helped me th through it. And, and really, I think they, 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 that person uh, ended up uh, cl closing uh, the company I was working with. We, we ended up working with AppQs because of that. So I think it's it's the happy moments and then the, the sad moments are the perfect time because the, the, the user or customer is very 
emotional and they either need help or they need some some kind of like uh, success uh, message that can really help them out with that. Great question, question Sunny. So, oh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I think it might have been Brian that was, was trying oh, to get a question. <laughs> Hey, Remley. Uh, so my background is mostly in CX, and it looks like you dabble in that area, especially with the onboarding. Uh, and I'm noticing a trend in the last year or so with the pandemic. How do you see the two worlds of marketing and CX continue to collide in each other in 2021? Yeah, when I, I think, and this is what I'm seeing with product-led companies is like marketing and CX um, and all the other companies, uh, uh, other functions really need to be like working hand in hand. And the reason why is if it doesn't, the ball gets dropped. And it, it was okay before where it's very sales-led where like um, there's the salesperson who's taking them through the whole journey. But the the, the gap from, from marketing to after somebody signs up it really needs to be super, super seamless or else, like I said, it's going to get dropped and, it, it, and the clear responsibility. And what I'm seeing, it, and this is what I saw with monday.com. I got a chance to chat with their CX team, uh, their CX, the customer experience team uh, and marketing team. They, they attend each other's meetings. So they would have like somebody uh, in the CX team attending marketing meetings and uh, somebody from the marketing team attending CX. And at the same time, CX attends sales and product attends marketing. So like they're kind of uh, really collaboratively working together and, and making sure that the whole experience is super, super seamless uh, and the uh, ball doesn't get dropped. Cool. Thanks for that. Anyone else want to jump in? Any thoughts, questions, things you wanted to share? I'll jump in quickly. Hi, Romley. Nice to meet you. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. This has been great. I, I'm just curious as a sort of a general question. What's something that surprised you this year professionally or maybe in the industry trends, something like that? That's a curveball. <laughs> Megan, thanks for that question. Um, what surprised me uh, around, shoot, I think you stumped, stumped me there. <laughs> what surprised me, maybe while, is there something that you could, do you have an answer for this? And then while you're responding, I'm going to think of something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I didn't mean to totally stump you. Oh, maybe, totally um, Okay, how about, how about this, maybe an interesting trend that you might see coming down the pike or, or something, maybe a direction that your space is headed that, uh, that you hadn't anticipated, but you think is kind of coming around the, the bend for 2022? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of trends, yeah, I, like I mentioned to, to Brian, like there's this um, seamless experience now happening uh, across the different functions, especially uh, between CX and, and marketing. And what's, what's, what I'm also seeing in, in terms of a trend is now they're actually marketing, sales, and CX and customer success ends up reporting to one, fun, uh, one like leader, whether there's a CRO, uh, another company that, I, that I, we were working with, uh, they, they were reporting to the VP of growth. So like instead of like all functions are reporting separately, uh, it's now they're all reporting to to uh, a, 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 se a senior leader who kind of makes sure that uh, everybody across the different functions are working together. I think that's for larger companies, um, but in terms of smaller companies, I'm, I'm definitely seeing a lot more trend towards product led uh, and a hybrid approach. Uh, it, it, even in the last Saster, uh, there's this this conference that happened. Everybody was just talking about product led and, and how important it is in terms of uh, the post-pandemic uh, world in terms of sales and, and marketing. Uh, and really the whole, the whole way that people buy now is totally different just because uh, people are tighter with their budget and really want to watch out that they're going to see value out of it before they make the purchase. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Actually, I, I work in the leadership space. I work for a leadership development firm in in-house marketing. So um, the organizational structure is definitely going to change the way the marketing team operates, as well as all of the other functional parts of the business, I agree, is going to change. I think it'll be interesting to see what that does to 
strategy and approach for for next year because I agree that that stuff is here to stay and um, we're looking at teams very differently and obviously teams um, are sort of at the forefront of innovation. So thank you for that answer. No problem. Thanks.